I wanted to measure every single type of how data enters my plot, my, my revenue tech systems. So I worked in cybersecurity. And so I'm like, okay, I want to know, like, if you look, if you look at the way hackers hack individuals, they can do through phishing emails. They can do websites. They can like in, find someone, they can do social engineering. They can find someone to get into that company. And it's just, it's very, you know, it's, there's a lot of ways data can enter. And now there is, it's even more intense because you have all these decentralized tools. Welcome to the Distributed Truth Podcast. Today's B2B SaaS teams all share one thing in common, fragmented customer data. Marketing, sales, customer success, finance, and product teams need better approaches to unified customer data. What does it look like to be data-driven rather than data-inhibited? What is the link between investing in unified customer data and revenue growth? How can we create consistent customer experiences through unified customer data? Join us here at the Distributed Truth Podcast as we interview a wide array of go-to-market revenue operations, technology, and data leaders, all dedicated to solving the problem of fragmented customer data. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Landgraf, head of marketing at Syncery, and welcome to another edition of the Distributed Truth Podcast. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Jomar Ebelita, the head of revenue operations at Paul Hastings also author of a brand new book that is packed with practical guidance and frameworks for how to do this job of revenue operations called Rethinking RevOps, uh, which will be kind of this, this, the theme of our conversation today. Jomar, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Anything else you'd like to add to, for, the, for the group about you know, your background and experience? Yeah, so um, a little bit about myself. I started in tech and cybersecurity. Um, I did the first AI in cybersecurity, which is great. And then I went into working in um, a lot of consulting firms after that. So I worked in, you know, tons of different types of big enterprise companies. Then I worked back in startups, again, in another cybersecurity company. Then I worked in networking, um, network security. And then I worked to work for Capgemini, which is a, a global digital transformation organization where I applied a lot of like dark funnel stuff in terms of behavior intent, um, per person-based advertising, account-based marketing, and then you know got recruited to Big Law to help transform their organization and digitally transform like their entire revenue technology architecture. So um, yeah, so I have a lot of experience from not just like transforming big companies, working my way up from working in someone's like garage to like unicorn status. And then also, you know, working in a lot of big organizations in digital transformation and, you know, having that security and legal background makes me feel, I feel and having a various industries, I feel makes me feel a little bit more like in tune with, you know, what is RevOps in different industries and in different stages of a company. Fascinating. Yeah. And it is so you know, interesting for me just to observe what is required out of a RevOps human at various stages of growth in the company maps with any other profession. But I feel like RevOps in particular is uniquely uh, positioned to evolve as the company evolves because they're driving a lot of that evolution, right? With data and processes and systems and obviously enabling people to do their, do their jobs. So. Exactly. But I mean, for most things like in a startup, right? Like you, when you start as a startup, you, ba you don't have that much data. You're literally competing with, if anything, you're competing with bigger companies that have that data. And I always think that like data is king for these people. Like what you're having to purchase data from other provided third party providers, right? And then you're trying to make a customer database. You're trying to make your CRM. You want to establish a CRM. You want to establish where you're going to source your main sources of data. So like every startup I go to, I, you know, you got to pick your CRM, you got to pick your marketing automation platform. You got to understand as you progress where your data lake is going to be, how you're going to store the data, how you're going to centralize all of these data, big data main points. Every company I go to, no matter what startup, big enterprise, no matter how many millions and billions of dollars you make, I will always look at where are you storing your data and work my way up. So I always have that data framework. And the great thing is, you know, back in like 2014, 2015, when I worked in like cybersecurity AI platforms, like they, I already knew like, 
data is the power, right? That's where that's where all of this generative AI is also layering on top. So mm -hmm. now we're in this amazing world where you need the data to make it work. And the big companies are gonna have their one up over you. So it's if you don't have control of your data, like someone else will, you know what I mean? And that's the part where that scares a lot of people because a lot of people are not as organized in, in understanding where each data comes from. Pixels, even pixels, pixels matter. You know what I mean? Data matters. So that's just making sure you're controlling that even from a startup organization, it matter, it's gonna help you scale your entire company because you're gonna know how to connect all of these pieces together. But yeah, the, 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 no matter how big, no matter what industry you are, you're at, it's always gonna be the same. Where do you centralize your data, right? And let's, uh, yes, couldn't agree more. And I know this is a key theme of your, your Rethinking RevOps book. So before we get into uh, some of the knowledge you share in that book, just would love to hear your, you know, kind of your motivation for, for writing the book. So a big portion of me, um, like writing the book, I saw a few things that were happening in the industry that I thought I could help resolve. One was understanding how to solve complex problems in your organization. So a lot of things that are happening with uh, marketing ops, sales ops, customer ops, partner ops, a lot of them are in this like process or, or like process system where they're literally just, a lot of them are just working the same thing. They're working the same Marketo campaign, same HubSpot campaign. They're working on the same reports. They don't know how to solve for complex problems. So I, so that's one of the big pieces I realized. And they don't know how to use resources to solve those complex problems. One of it is like, they don't know how to use, like put business cases together to where after this, I, I've mastered this and I love it so much because like in terms of, I put a business problem t together and I ask my team, I ask everyone in my team, right? I use a double diamond, the same thing as a user inter user design. I basically use the same concept they do. I get the whole stakeholders involved inside my team, outside. I use external um, vendors too, to do all the work for me. I literally just ask the right questions. They answer the questions. I send it to the vendor. They do all the technical requirements for it. I send it back to the IT. They give me their me method, but the time it's sent to me all the work is done then I just look at the vendor like what's the price and then I'm like that's a double diamond you literally decenter you literally do so I don't know if you guys have ever seen the double diamonds the framework but it helps solve complex problems for user interface and it's something that RevOps can do to basically use to solve complex problems where you're diverging, you're asking for information from everywhere else, from other books, from other resources, competitors, um, other tech providers too, and internal stakeholders, external stakeholders like other vendors, they do all the divergent work for you of get, gathering that if you ever, like whatever problem you might have, they do all the work for you. Then you converge and just put it together in a pretty, like make a story out of it and make it really nice for requirement purposes. And then you send it back, diverge it, send it all back to them. Does this all make sense? Converge it back and get a price point, demo it, try it out. You know, this PLG, there's like, pro, like you could you try it out with a demo, with a free demo. And then there you go. Does it work? Does it not work? And then <laughs> that's literally how you solve complex problems in revenue operations. But the problem is not a lot of people in the industry are doing that because a lot of people are button pushers or are doing are just they're creating campaigns creating programs and they're just they don't know how to like take a step back and realize how do i make everyone else do the work for me and i just like make it pretty and conceptualize it and then get the pricing and demo it and try it out if the platform works just do three to four platforms. That's it. Just three to four platforms, whatever problems you have. You send your requirements to your internal team, send it to those vendors. They'll do all the work. Trust me, they want the money. And hmm. so they'll do the work. They have sec security operate. They have sales engineers that will do the work for you. So it's like, and they, if not, they already have the documentation. So you just got to pre represent that to your team and then, you know, demo out the product if it works. And if three to four, that's like the magic number for any vendor. 
So that, that's a big problem that I'm seeing. And then the second problem was like, how do you organize this? Like what is, so a lot back in the day, like a regular marketing funnel is just a regular funnel pyramid, right? Like a backwards pyramid. And then you look, uh, or you look, it's a regular, yeah, it's a regular pyramid. No, no, it's a backwards pyramid. Sorry. And then, then you look at ABM. It's like an, uh, like upside down pyramid. And then mm-hmm. now what RevOps is a bow tie, right? You're combining that marketing funnel with the customer section. And the reason why it's so important is because upsells and cross sales have lower acquisition costs. You know what I mean? If you do an up, like every, every consulting firm, every product, that's why subscription, mat, the subscription works so well because it's so easy once they get in. There's lower thresholds. You don't have to go to security. You don't have to go to procurement. It's already done. So like you're just collecting the bill. That's why the end of the puzzle matters. Expansion and also cross, cross selling and cross product selling. Because if you can sell the, if you already sold your service, you could probably sell your product. If you sold your product, you could probably sell your service for more, which expands the account, which has less acquisition costs and less time for you to cash to value. That's why it's so important. And then once you advocate for them, they can, a lot of the turnover for RevOps is pretty high, sales ops, marketing ops too. A lot of them only stay there for two to three years. So once they get you, they, once they, you already love the product, you're most likely be like, I, we have some for the same problem in this other industry or the same company. I want to use it for this. You don't know how many times I've brought pro- products from big organizations to small ones, to big ones, to smaller ones. And like, they don't even, I don't even get a cut of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause I'm the one that, that wants the problem, but guess what? My, my cap, my, my sales cycle is one day one day because I love the product so much. Sometimes if, if I'm, if I have that power, I would sign the paper right away. And it's like, people have like, people are amazed how like, Oh my God, like how'd you get into that plot? I'm a, I become, you become an anomaly in a lot of these pro- people's product reports and sales reports. Cause it's like, how did that, you, you have to take them out because like these people are like, people like me are going to mess up your sales cycle report because I'm a, such, such an advocate. And now I'm in a point in my career where I have a position where I can bring products in pretty fast. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Cause I love it so much, but that's why the bow tie funnel works so well and why r- people are starting to focus more on it because you can upsell and cross sell so much easier and increase the value to the company so much more because of yeah. it. So we were, we were having a debate about the bow tie internally this week. And, you know, part of the debate was we don't have a visual for the bow tie necessarily, but we definitely have the standard marketing funnel. I feel like every marketing ops, sales ops, rev ops organization has some semblance of the marketing funnel. And then, you know, CS is also dealing with um, their own funnels around, you know, onboarding, time to value, identification of cross sell, upsell, right? So. Mm-hmm. Like, what's your take on what is missing in organizations? You know, mapping this back to, say, the need to centralize and unify data, right? Like, are people executing on the bow tie and with success from your point of view, or is there something missing out there? So it really depends, right, on, like, a lot of things depends, but it depends on, like, the organization that you're at, right? If you're, like, we're very more service-oriented, like, I work at a law firm, we're very service-oriented as opposed to, like, a product or SaaS um, industry, but that also, like, we are getting a lot of data, right? Like, the most important thing is, like, the inter relationships, like now you can measure relationships, right? Like, and that's all data oriented, like how many emails do you send? How many like phone calls do you have? How many text messages do you have? Those are all decentralized data now. So like a part of us, it's like, and also behavior intent, right? And also like, what is a company's intent in doing a certain product or service and who has the most strongest relationship with that person? So they can, they can position us to a way where they can, you know, present our multiple services to them again. And so the problem that I'm seeing is not, is also like the, the break, right. Of their entire. So there's a bow tie funnel, but what I'm seeing for the upsell and cross sell, what I'm having a lot of firms or a lot of companies are especially SaaS products is like, they don't bring that in that data into their marketing and sales team. And that's what I'm seeing is like a lot of them don't bring that data in. Like if you, you have a product, a lot of them haven't fully like done the circle yet of like, you know, Hey, this person has this much usage on their product. They're doing this and this, 
how do we upsell and cross sell them in that type of way where it's like it and you don't want to do it aggressively right like i hate an aggressive salesperson it's it comes off very like needy and it's like uh for me i'm more of a you know subtle kind of type to sell to me i'm very like you know more subtle in terms of you know how you can you do it through like a way where it's like oh yeah you might need this and this to make these features work kind of person um so you might need to increase your scope. So for me, I think it's lack of um, centralizing different prop type of product data, interaction data, and ter terms of behavior intent data as well. And centralizing that to where you can make an action in understanding what best product or service is next for this individual. So that's something where product meets marketing meets sales that and meets customer success where they all need to work together and understand triggers and handoffs that work really well, fluidity. And that I see a lot of companies that are acquiring big other companies that have mm -hmm. problems with this. And I'm literally getting phone calls from six different accounts. Like I'm like, didn't you just acquire that company? Why are you calling me about Tableau when you, I just got on a phone call with Salesforce. Like, aren't you guys the same company? Like, don't you like want to look at my contract that I've already signed prior to calling me? So it's like, for me, there's even a big organization like that, like that have millions and billions of dollars have the same problem. They don't know how to centralize their data and they don't know how to work together in a cohesive way where they hand off that person's data to make an action step for the cross sell and upsell. So it's, mm -hmm. it's prolific in a lot of companies and industries. Yeah. And so let's, let's dig into that pain around data unification a bit. Another thing we were discussing that I know you have some strong points of view on is like, okay, if I think about the maturity of, of data unification for RevOps people, you know, there's like, hey, let's dump everything into the CRM and then maybe let's also combine that with spreadsheets and we'll do our, our kind of reporting and analytics that way. Very immature, right? Um, works maybe in startup land, but doesn't work much past that. And then there's, hey, we need to get a data lake, data warehouse, dump everything into the warehouse, right? Um, where, where do you see people falling down at like each of those phases, either like CRM centric um, centralization or, or, or data warehouse centric centralization? Well, that's that's kind of the reason why I made like I did the multiple factor swim lane too, is because I wanted to measure every single type of how data enters my plot, my my revenue tech systems. So I worked in cybersecurity. And so I'm like, OK, I want to know, like, if you look, if you look at the way hackers hack individuals they can do through phishing emails they can do websites they can like in, find someone they can do social engineering they can find someone to get into that company and it's just it's very you know it's there's a lot of ways data can enter and now there is it's even more intense because you have all these decentralized tools they just came up with the new martech stack and that's just marketing that's not even including sales tech stack partner sales tax part uh, like customer tech stack so it's like they're not even considering all the other technology stacks that are out there and so i wanted to create like a framework that people can follow and how all those like that's that's like a, just for martech stack right now they said it's eleven thousand fifty four tools, right? That's all. It's a lot of tools. And that's not even taking into account all the API fields, all the pixels, all of the different ways data is in, in, in those tools. So how do you centralize that to where if someone goes into your company, how do you organize each stage? And that's what the, like I wanted to like help and put in the book. Cause then what you could do is look at all those tools, look at all those APIs, how they're passing back and forth each other and then be like, okay, how do I unify this one, one data like field where, okay, the person comes through a form in an email. How did that person get there? And then all list out all your technology tools that, you know, all the way to close or all the way to an upsell and cross sell, you need to know all the, all the tools and you need to know all the data. So data unification is super important because that brings everything together. And the Salesforce, it's not meant to do that. It's meant to be a CRM. It's not meant to unify data. I, when I was in consulting, I used to work, I used to do, you know, the top 
search company out there. Like they, I was helping with a lot of troubleshoot that they had with their, like their platforms and they used to do workflows. And like what I learned is like, it used to take a week because their platform, like Marketo, HubSpot, Pardot, Eloqua, all of these platforms are not meant to handle big data. After series like B or C is when I start seeing a lot of problems with a lot of data in these different types of startups. And having a big, like, you know, working in like a big law firm now and working in like having worked in Capgemini, we suffer the exact same problem. So you want to unify a lot of these data in a way where it's easy for RevOps people, for marketing automation people to basically get a grasp on and, and like, hey, we don't need this. And they also get rid of like a lot of tools. Data unification is one thing, but also because of you're doing data unification, you're also decreasing the cost because you're understanding, oh, I don't need this tool anymore. I don't need that tool anymore. So then you're like getting rid of six, seven tools that you don't even need anymore. And then your data looks better because then you have a data unification platform where it's like, okay, you have a data unification. You could do lead like appending a lot better and cleaner. It scales nicer. You don't have to wait hours and days just to get you know clean data from all the appending platforms you have anymore and it just like scales after series b or c now you can go go to public and have you know and be very easy and once you do that once you have a clean data in terms of you know organizing all your data platforms and and all your data fields and api fields it looks really really nice in a in a business visualization, you know, a BI tool, right? So whatever BI tool you have, it just looks so much cleaner. And, you know, once you do that, it's also creates a good documentation system for the team, for anyone that goes after you. So then you feel a little bit better that you're, when, if you leave for a better role, that you're not leaving, you know, you're not a gatekeeper anymore for, for all those decentralized tools and data fields. You have a platform where you're like, or you have documentation that you'd be like, okay, here you go. It's almost an insurance policy for the company as well. So there's just a lot of benefits to understanding your data from all these decentralized tools and mapping it out in a buying cycle. I see serious decisions in Topo. They do this very similar things, but they're like not looking at the data. They're looking at the content. They're looking at the buying content. Oh, what content are they using? But it's like, I'm looking at data. You know what I mean? Like that's what I care about the most. So yeah. And, and to, to carry this value forward, you know, based on your experience, I think it, it's will be useful for the audience to hear how you, map the value of having unified data into things like better security and uh, more uh, better readiness for things like AI. So w when you unify the data in certain stages, you're then able to f figure out like, okay, this individual, this stakeholder works in this tool and this is the data that gets collected for this because data is all power that generative AI, all of those are powered through data right now. I think we're in a, we're reaching a cap where we're just about like, we're like peeking in it. We haven't fully been immersed in it. I think it's like, give it another like few more months or even years, I feel, or like a few more years. And I think we're in a path of like, you know, being able to utilize as much as possible. Like for us, like now you can just put in, like I'm look right now I'm studying all, I'm looking, studying, getting demos of all the generative AIs in law. Right. I'm looking at every single one. How what type of data? The first thing I do is like what type of data? What is your what is the object? Like what is the centralized way of how you guys are gathering objects? What objects are you centralizing? You know what I mean? And by doing that, you can basically take whatever data data um, values you have, inject that into generative AI or any type of AI platform that you do have and be able to ask complex questions. Like now you, I can go in there and input a different type. Like I know a lot of BI people, they use generative AI to help with the coding and to also help with like trying to answer questions. Like now you can plug your data in and ask sophisticated or different questions that you might ask a data analyst, you know what I mean? That would take them a while to answer they'd be like, all right, this is your highest, you know, this is your higher, this is the highest campaign that you had with the most ROI. So it's like, it really just depends on the way you take in data. So just like anything before, you know, collecting data, unifying it in a way that makes sense for your company. And also the helps you with future tools that will use that 
as power and juice to like power up their own, you know, j- creative J and machine learning thinking like platforms. So it's, it really is. It's like whoever controls the data is going to win. And yes, the people on the top are going to have more data than you. And the only way that you can, the only way you can come like be in par with them is like you have control of your data sets and you know what questions you're asking, you know, what's going to move the needle. And so that to me, that's the most important thing is like, like the people on the top, like the Googles, the Facebooks, they've been collecting data forever now. Like, you know what I mean? Like Twitter, like all of these companies have the data, like, and that's the scariest part about this. But like, you can also have control of like, what type of data that you guys are, com- your company is collecting. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I think about that, often that, 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 that Facebook meta has literally 20 years of data about me. There is no other mm-hmm. company that I have that type of relationship with. And it's not a good relationship. I'm like never on the platform anymore, but it's just it's mind blowing that um, that's how well, much that, they- Not even that, they're also program. collecting mobile data. Yes, as well, exactly. Right? I don't have the app on my phone for that they, very reason. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So a lot of them, they pre they pre um, think they, a lot of when you first download it before they had the security settings, they had the automatic um, location. So a lot of people were selling your data. I can literally find you, Aaron, by paying $300 in the black market and find your exact coordinates because people are already selling your data online. Yeah. That was prolific back in the day where people are literally selling your data. So it's like, imagine that with like AI. So it's like, that. that's kind of the main reason, another reason why I wrote the book. It's just like a lot of the, um, like I said, a lot of the marketing ops and operations people, they don't understand how to map the data with the different stages of the, the cycle. And they don't know what technology they're using. They are, they're like not understanding how to correlate all the different API fields as well with the stage of the buying team. So that's, that's yeah. why, you know, I wanted to make their job easier, basically. And, and that was gonna be my, my last question as we wrap this up. You know, we, we talked to a lot of RevOps pros about data unification and often, I'd say perhaps the most common objection that we hear, nobody says this isn't a problem. Everybody agrees that unifying data get, will get their business to a better place the, the objection sounds something like from a RevOps pro, um, this isn't my problem to solve uh, or I don't have the authority to go off and get data from all these disparate systems or yeah, I don't know how to do it. Um, so what would be your advice to those, those folks, both in terms of you know, like building a, a business case to solve something like this? I know you have some of that in, in your book and then also like where to get started. So, like, I think for me, the, the first thing I would do is, you know, get the people in the room, right? Get a conversation started, it, like individually, depending on the political structure of your company, you can either fill, build relationships. Because uh, what RevOps um, needs to understand is that you're, build, you're not just building relationships. Like a lot of marketing ops or sales ops that are going into these roles or partner ops or customer ops is that you're no longer just building relationship with one one individual subsection of your company. You're building relationships with literally every single piece of your company and you wanna make sure that they're empowered and that they're heard, they're empowered, and you know that that you're there to support them and you're a support system for them. So for me, like, I, I think that's one stage is making sure that you have, you built a good relationship with all the different types of departments that you support, but also like in your team. And also understand like, hey, they are an integral part of the journey. So for me, the first thing I would do is making sure like a lot of, I've seen a lot of documentations for a lot, especially as a consultant, like back in the day when I used to go and I used to see like tons of documents of like hundreds of pages of documents. And I'm like, oh, this is, I just want to know like how this data field is being like passed around or stakeholders, you know what I mean? And understand. So my thing, I would make sure the first thing I would do is like map out my technology with the buying cycle 
that's the first thing I do in every company. I literally go in, I look at all the, the reports. How is all data coming into our company? Who's touching all the data? Then I make friends with the people that are touching the data. Like, oh, what are you selecting here? Blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, and then I'm like, what reports are you looking at? Like, what are, what are, respo- what are you sending to your boss? What reports are you sending to your boss? You know what I mean? And how can I make that easier for you? Once they realize you're making their life easier for them, the, the, you know, the relationship gets a lot better. And then the rapport gets a lot better as well, especially with the managers too. Like um, a lot of the platforms that I always go into is making sure that you have good change management in your organization. And that means also data management. So data management and change management come together very harmoniously. And that's conversations that people need to start talking more about different stakeholders is that data management is part of change management and it needs to be more transparent of to all your stakeholders what data you're connecting and how you're unifying all of them together because then you're understanding this is my handoff for this individual this is my handoff to this to the next person in the team and they understand what type of data they're responsible for that needs to be you know, known and transparent in your change management process. And that's what, what's part of like the training process as well. So I would make sure when I go to a new organization, I map out my buying cycle, what type of stage they're putting on their lead, what type of stage they're putting on their opportunity. And at the bottom, like just like, like on the book, like I put what data fields are you putting? You know what I mean? What, and then you could even add a section at the, at the bottom and, and be like, what type of questions am I asking my sales, like the customer to get to this question? You know, you could do an extra step on there and just make sure you have your data fields in mind. And when you send that, when you pass it on to another person, they know what data fields. So like I, and then, you know, that helps with the whole, once everyone's on board with that whole, you know, everyone has a standard baseline. They know exactly what data is being passed between each stakeholders. It really helps. And, you know, having a adoption to any technology that you have and also making your team a little bit more transparent. Like this is what I'm responsible for because mm-hmm. it's not that people don't want to be responsible as a, a lot of people don't know how to be responsible because there's so many technology out there. There's so many fields that they're responsible for. If you give us a particular individual, like these are the seven things I want you to prioritize, then that's it. Like they will do that. It's not like people don't want to do it. They just don't know like if that's my job or not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And are you, I mean, do you feel like you've been in places where people are telling you what the priorities are in terms of what data needs to be unified? Uh, or are you setting those priorities more often than not? So it, and I guess it depends, but i like, I use that word a lot, but, um, it, it like, it depends on the comp, like different teams, right? Like, okay. Yeah. And then I have to kind of negotiate like data negotiation is a thing. (laughs) That is a thing that I don't think a lot of people even talk about is data negotiation within stakeholders and making sure, okay, is this the right fields that I should be capturing? Right. And then how much fields am I, how many percentage are you like, I even come back to them like, Oh, Hey, you're only using like 5% of this field. Like there's really nothing that much. Like when you do a data hygiene, you're like, I look at how much percentage of fields usage per technology that I have. That's part of the Mm. like hygiene that I do. And I'm like, no, this tool isn't like this field isn't being used that much. Do you, because it's something that we can combine. So, Right now I have a new Salesforce instance, right? I brought in Salesforce to a global organization, did it pretty quickly for a law firm. And like my first thing is like, I have to negotiate as I'm building and customizing the Salesforce instance and be like, do you need like, how do we position this where it can scale further? And like, which fields we're gonna be using. So it really like, to me depends, but the type of relationship and organization I'm in. But right now, because I'm I'm buying, like I'm, purchasing the tool for the company and I'm helping set that standard and like setting up all the different custom objects, I can ask my stakeholders like, oh, you know, like, do you really need this? Or what type of fields do you need? I separate it like description of the field, the the business benefits and like the values it has, like API values. So for me, like I, I want to make, I have that dictionary all, all like pretty much cleaned up and I, it makes sure that, like, hey, there's a business value to every field that is created. And there is a reason why we have it, not just API field, text name, like, or the value. Like I have a business value 
like row on there to show people like there's a business value. And then, um, yeah, so it's like data negotiation, data field negotiation is something. And then making sure that all unifies in a platform that works really, really well is really important because like I said, there's not even like, yes, there's 11,000 fields in MarTech and there's like, but there's over millions of API fields that you have to deal with. And that's the part where data unification matters. And as we're go approaching you know, generative AI and all, all these things, data matters. Data control, data matters in terms of like how you control it, how you manipulate it, how it's going past through all these different systems and processes. That's gonna really matter in how the, the output you're gonna get, you know what I mean, from, from all your other processes. Because you're gonna be like, there's time where eventually you're gonna be like, how do I get the most leads this year? Enter. You're gonna to have to unify that all of your fields, all your API fields, all your platforms to answer that one question. You know what I mean? So that's how data unification works. But I think it's gonna really help how businesses run. Um, a lot of when it, generative AI is really gonna help how business leaders run their companies. But it starts with data unification. Yeah. The, the, the story I always like to tell is, you know, we have uh, customers who have shared with us that it has taken them three months just to align internally on the definition of an account. Like, how is generative AI going to make sense of account data shared across, you know, 30 different systems when internally you haven't even aligned on what an account actually is? Like, that is the table stakes work to be done to get all the value out of um, any, you know, analytics or AI solution dumped on top of your data or piled on top of your data. Um, yeah, you, you th that's funny enough. I, I actually had the same conversation when my new CMO came. They're like, what is a, what is an account? I'm like, it's a company. And they're like, why don't we call it company? I'm like, that's how the platform names it. You know what I mean? For me, sure. as an individual that just like, I have so many other things to worry about. Like, you got to pick your battles, dude. You got to like understand, like someone wants to name a field, something, you know, just, and it, if it does not hurt you, it doesn't like, you got to stop being so petty with, with like names, like how things are named and just be like, all right, this is the name across the board. Whoever has a higher, whoever has a higher position gets to name the thing. And I'm like, and that's going to set the standard. And then you have to portray to them the new leader that comes in. It's like, okay, it's going to take a lot of hours to basically change all of those fields from all those platforms. And we have to change all this documentation. Is it really worth your time and our time as a company to name that field? So that's, to, that's how I get around it. Cause I'm like, yeah. whoever well, at mean, the time, go, what go is ahead. it? I was going to say, I, I don't I'm even like, think that was their problem. I think their, their problem was what, uh, what business logic, right? Represented an account in CS land was different than mm -hmm. marketing and sales, right? So the, yeah, the field label was a natural kind of, it, it can be, the field label can be different across systems, but like what actually that field is representing in the systems was different. I think that was their challenge. Oh, which I, I see. Pretty, so they, they was, yeah, that, that's pretty confusing, but I feel like at that time, then you, you can just ask, okay, who has the most usage to the different platforms and who's like, okay, who has the higher up? Because since you're going to have to go to the higher, I mean, like, just ask these one question and then that's it. And sometimes I have been fortunate enough to be like, all right, this is the way it's going to go. And you can, I call it disagree to agree. Yeah. If, if someone disagrees, you just have to agree because at the end of the day, I'm making the business decision. So you're going to have to agree with it. Like yeah. that's, Alignment and agreement are two different things. Yeah. It's like, yes, let's all align to this decision, regardless of whether or not you agree to it because it's happening. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Exactly. It's a lot. It's, I call it disagree to agree, right? You got to agree to, you got to, all, even if you disagree, you got to agree because you have to work. You're the, you're going to be the admin for it, so that's you're going to work for it. So, yeah, yep. awesome. Well, we, we got. Let's see. We got uh, data management is part of change management. That's I, I love that one. I'm going to take that one uh, <laughs> to, to the bank. Data negotiation is a thing. Couldn't agree more. Uh, got to disagree to agree. Uh, there's some some good little tidbits in there. Thank you so much, Jamar. And by the way, for folks. Um, so Jamar's uh, ebook just hit. Uh, I mean, how, when when did you release it? Maybe a month ago, a couple weeks ago. Uh, yeah, two week a week ago, like okay. yeah, a week and a half ago. So I yeah. have a paperback version and ebook version on Amazon. 
Awesome. And you can find the link to the ebook in the, in the podcast description. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll drop it in a, in a newsletter as well to all our subscribers. So, um, Jamar, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Always good chatting with you. And, uh, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for listening to the distributed truth podcast. Check out our other episodes or visit syncery.com to learn more about unified customer data. That's S Y N C A R I syncery.com. Thank you. Have a great day.